Nebraska, one of the most sparsely populated places in the US and its least visited state. It's so remote that the Pentagon has its nuclear command here and it's where they flew President Bush for safety on 9-11. They also grow a lot of corn in Nebraska. It's a state that seldom attracts attention and that's the way Nebraskans like it. We're a nice little quiet sleeping state. We'd like to stay that way. But it's not staying that way. The presidential race is incredibly close. And because of a quirk in Nebraska's election rules, its biggest town, Omaha, is now at the epicenter of the national storm. I'm actually going to talk about Nebraska for a minute. I know we never talk about Nebraska, but stay with The election all come down to Nebraska. Donald Trump thinks so. The race for 270 electoral votes could come down to Nebraska's sprawling second district. And here's why. If Harris carries the three blue wall battleground states and Trump wins the swing states across the Sun Belt, a single electoral vote surrounding Omaha could keep the race from becoming a 269-269 tie. It really truly looks like CD2 in Nebraska could be the deciding vote in this election. There is a scenario, and it's not as far-fetched as it sounds, where control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency could come down to CD2. This is a little different. The last few days have been insanely intense. Are you seeing a lot more attention from politicians, of people mailing you or emailing you to try and get them to vote for them this uh, time more than others? Yeah, definitely ads. Definitely I, ads I would on say, TV. Yeah, more ads. Definitely ads on social media. But, Not and it's media, everywhere. Like, like what, like YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. It's just everywhere that you that you see now, I guess. Everything you turn on is there. Yeah. Yes. Harris or Trump. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. So, yeah. The idea that, you know, politicians never come to Nebraska, they never pay any attention, they're busy in Pennsylvania or Florida, whatever yeah. the swing state is. Mm -hmm. And now they are coming to listen to you guys because they need you to vote for once. Yeah. What do you think about it? Uh, maybe if they would have, I don't know, maybe come a little bit sooner because it's always this time, you know, during the election year where obviously it's super close. Just, yeah. It's yeah. almost like picking like the lesser of the two evils. <laughs> Decided who you're going to vote for. Honestly, no. <laughs> I thought I had someone in mind. I don't know, maybe it's trust, trusting. Right. You know, Either like you them. said, like the yeah. lesser of the it's, two it's very, it's very hard to know what's yeah. the truth anymore. Because the, the cost of this race will be the highest it's ever been, period. The Democrats are spending money here trying to win the blue dot. Uh, that's Kamala's easiest path to victory is shoring up the blue wall and adding Nebraska to. Mm -hmm. So they're spending copious amounts of money. Our race is always expensive, and it's only going to continue getting more and more expensive as our politics become more, more pervasive. I mean, every, every day you're getting phone calls, texts, digital ads on your phone, um, and campaigning is just getting more expensive. I think people get uh, rightfully uh, annoyed, but the voters in this district on Election Day will be some of the most informed voters in the whole country. Uh, the Biden team and the Trump team had, had, had offices in 2020. The difference is the level of staffing. The, the Harris campaign has staffed up at a level that is unusual for a Democrat in Nebraska. I mean, they have a lot of ground game going right now. The Republicans, because it's a red state, have not had to do as much paid staff. They get a lot easier volunteer uh, run, but they also haven't invested as much this, this go around as the Trump team did last time. And the money that both campaigns are pouring in, especially the TV advertising, is incredible. It, it is. I, honestly, yesterday, uh, talking to uh, a couple of people, we're talking an economic impact in the tens of millions. Um, I, I, I would bet that there are radio and television stations that make their year <laughs> on this year. This is the latest front in the battle for Omaha. Mysteriously coded yard signs. Harris supporters struck first. So Ruth and I, we were watching the first day of the Democratic National Convention. So we're kind of political junkies, so, so we were watching that. And usually the first day is kind of boring or not really the big headline day. But the, the story was emerging, and it had been for a while, that when Kamala was a child, she would go home and complain to her mom and say her complaint. Her mom was patient, nurturing, would listen. But then she'd say, okay, you've said your complaint, do something. So that was the impetus for it, or the catalyst. I can't tell you the number of times I heard, what, what's with all the blue dots? Yeah. And that started a conversation. Um, so when people stop by our house, they have that story to share. It's an important election, yes. Right. And I think 
it's not just Omaha that cares more. I think the whole U.S. cares more. Actually, I might go so far as to say the world cares more. Well, I want them to know that voting is important and that is a part of their rights and that we want to show with these signs in our yard that first of all that um, we're homeowners, we pay our taxes, so we want we should be able to vote and show our solidarity with what it is that we do. You pleased with the sign? Yeah. You like the sign? I love the spray paint. <laughs> the more of these signs I see go up, at least in my town and with our one electoral that we have, yeah. I am I am fully confident that we will give it to Kamala Harris because we believe Trump is a pure racist at his heart. In the liberal suburb of Dundee, where the Browns live, almost every house now has a blue dot outside it. Dundee also has a very prominent resident. Omaha's most famous son is Warren Buffett, who's the millionaire investor currently the seventh richest man in the world with some 130 billion dollars to his name and even he's normal this is his house in a quiet omaha neighborhood and it's the very same house he bought for thirty one thousand dollars in 1958. no blue dot outside warren buffett's house though playing politics could be expensive now trump campaigners are retaliating and so we've seen this little blue dot go around and this is just our statement saying we are not a blue dot we are a red state right. we want to show that it's not just one area of the state that should control the whole state we are all one big state and everybody's voice should matter we just started this about 10 days ago and we've had over 1500 sign requests so right. we are getting them printed as quickly as requests come in we have a whole team of volunteers trying to deliver them to people's doors so we are we're out every day delivering signs uh, i get more requests in every day and we're just trying to keep up we we have this term nebraska nice and we truly are nebraska nice you will see a lot of division maybe more in the media where that picks it up but when you're out walking around and talking to your neighbors, regardless of if you have a red, a red Nebraska sign or a blue dot, everybody is pr pretty respectful to each other. We've had a few naysayers yell at us, but we just look at them respectfully and, and say, hey, we are, uh, we are e expressing our First Amendment right just as you are. Uh, yeah, I, we see tension between neighbors. Between neighbors? And you haven't seen that before? No, we've seen it before, but we've seen it probably at a higher level. Higher level now. Right. We don't like those blue dots. So what are these tensions? Huh? What are these tensions? It, you keep your political opinions to yourself. Why yeah. do we have to put blue dot in a lot? It could be, because it's such a close race. Yeah. It could be that any two, that one electoral vote decides it. So there's a... There's I hope a not. Why do you hope not? It's, I, it's I, great I, to have the power. I, I think, I hate Nebraska to have that stand. I hate Nebraska to have that stand. What stand? The stand of being the decision maker. Why is that a stand? That's a great power. Because, because, because we're five electoral votes. Yeah. We don't need a big voice. But that's not our style. You, you could be kingmakers. Oh, that feels good, Kingmakers. yeah. But well, we are in America. We don't do the kings. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about Nebraskans is we don't necessarily want to be in the spotlight because Nebraskans, we are workhorses, not show horses. And I know you hear that term in Congress a lot, but in Nebraska, we really do. We just work hard. We want to support our families. And we don't necessarily like being in the national spotlight all the time. We just want to do what's right for Nebraskans. Republicans have got another tactic mm -hmm. to get that incredibly precious one electoral vote uh, of Omaha. They call it winner takes all. How does that work? Uh, winner take all is what the other 48 states already do. And it's basically the statewide winner uh, of the presidential popular vote gets all of the electoral votes. In Nebraska's case, that would be five electoral votes. Uh, because Republicans hold a two-to-one registration advantage over Democrats in this state, there's very little doubt over which candidate would win all five if they didn't break it up by congressional district. 
And we had a big Trump supporter, Senator Lindsey Graham, in Omaha last week. Yeah, he, he came uh, as part of efforts uh, organized by Governor Jim Pillen, uh, Nebraska Republican, and uh, U.S. Senator Pete Ricketts, um, another Republican. They were trying to work together to make a last push with any Republican holdouts. They had two dozen state senators met at the mansion and talked about uh, what those holdouts might need to know. Uh, I, I call it a little bit of the soft-gloved approach. My understanding was if that didn't work, that there was an effort being organized uh, that might have ramped up some of the pressure. Look, they're very worried about the election, as they should be. The American people every day see the contrast. They can't win legitimately, so they always try to change the rules at the last minute. Tonight, it will be through a democratic process. The entire federal delegation of Nebraska House members and two senators want this change. To my friends in Nebraska, that one electoral vote could be the difference between Harris being president or not, and she's a disaster for Nebraska and the world. So you broke quite a big story on Monday about Mike McDonald. Yeah, he, he, um, he spent the weekend, I think, thinking over and hearing from a number of people, whether it was national union leaders uh, for his uh, fire union, whether it was people on the left and right, the presidential campaigns. Uh, my understanding is actually that he may have actually spoken to Trump over the weekend, too. Trump himself. <laughs> right, right. They, they deny or, or they actually say they won't talk about any conversations that he had. But my sources are, are pretty good that, that Trump himself may have spoken with him in some fashion. Um, but uh, on Monday, he announced that he was a no. Uh, he made it fairly firm. And Donald Trump was left pretty unhappy by that decision. You think he tweeted about it very late at night, calling him... <laughs> the funniest part of that is he called him a, 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 a Republican former Democrat, uh, which the president, the former president himself is also. It called, of course, and he called him a yet another grandstander. That is true. But in Trump language, that is actually pretty mild criticism uh, of someone who didn't do what he, what he, what he hoped. I, I think we're going to see both uh, principles visit sometime down the stretch. Do you recall the last presidential race where both the Democratic and the Republican candidate came to Omaha? You might, I, I don't, right offhand, and so I'd have to double check, but I would look back, I, I would bet Kennedy. That's yeah, I think the president can still win this district. I think focusing on the issues uh, is critical. Um, my, my boss, Congressman Bacon, always focuses on the issues. He doesn't get as involved uh, in personality or, or name calling, and I think that's what this district uh, values and appreciates. Nebraska nice is very real here. The president has his style, which has been politically successful for him, there's no doubt. Mm. But I think in this district, we reward uh, issues, serious uh, policy discussions. That's what this district is looking for. So if it is a tie, and even Nebraska doesn't break it, what then happens? It's the nightmare scenario, and one that's now seriously worrying the experts. If no one wins a majority of electoral votes, and the only scenario that, that would produce that would be a tie, then the election would be decided in the House of Representatives. Incidentally, the Senate would decide the vice president, but the vote in the House would not be a simple majority vote. It would be a vote of the delegations from each state. So each of the 50 states would get one vote. And even though Republicans have a very narrow advantage in the House today overall and could lose it by the time the vote would happen, they are likely to retain a majority of state by state delegations. Currently, they they hold majorities in 28 of the 50 states. So if it's a direct tie, 269, 269, Donald Trump wins. Donald Trump would be very likely to win in that scenario, yes. Okay, so it's happened twice before, not once before. That's right. Yeah. In both 1800 and 1824, there was uh, no one received a, a, an electoral college uh, majority. Look, there's no living memory of how to do a contingent election because, again, it hasn't happened in 200 years. Um, so this would be uncharted territory for, for everyone. And we might think we know how it would work out, but maybe it wouldn't necessarily work out that way. One important wrinkle is that if there's a Democratic Speaker of the House, uh, that person may just not want to roll over and let a Republican win the contingent election in the 
uh, in the House. And so I do worry about what would happen in a situation like that, because I think to the general public, they would have no clue as to what this process actually was and basically how strange it would be. Um, would the system better withstand such sort of in intense pressure? No one knows the answer to that question. And just imagine the kind of supercharged scenario we had in 2000 when we had an extended recount in the decisive state of Florida that hinged on hanging chads and uh, recounts, uh, hand ballot recounts uh, and butterfly ballots. And there was intense uh, legal uh, battles between the parties. There were uh, intense uh, protests. And yet in today's era of uh, disinformation and AI and existential politics and believing that the other side is not only ill-intentioned, but in, in many cases evil, then we might not be able to withstand the pressures that a very close election would pose. It would come down to our judicial system and the court's ability to enforce their will uh, and then our, our our political leaders ability to manage uh, or, or uh, pull us back from the social unrest that would be virtually guaranteed uh, because one side is bound to to uh, end up on the short end of the stick and be very angry about it and believe that the election was administered unfairly in some way. So America waits for the outcome of the most turbulent election in decades, and whether it will come down to Nebraska, where more than anywhere, they pray it's not a tie.